Hello everyone, it's Charlie Westeros, and welcome to my review for Game of Thrones Season 4, Episode 3, entitled Breaker of Chains. Um, this review is spoiler-free, so there are no spoilers from the books in this review, so if you are just a TV show viewer, feel free to watch this, you will not have anything ruined for you. Um, also, normally I put more effort and time into my reviews, However, I am back home in Quebec for the weekend, so I really don't have that much time to dedicate to this specific review, unfortunately. However, I do have a lot of thoughts, and I got a lot to say nonetheless. Um, and of course, if you enjoyed this review, uh, don't hesitate to subscribe, like this video, comment if you have any thoughts. By all means, I always enjoy commentary, so... Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I also usually have a lot more detailed notes, but again, I'm literally coming at you all right after watching this episode, and it was such a freaking amazing episode. I really enjoyed it, so I just have the need to share my thoughts with you right away. And uh, as you can tell from my notebook, these are my really budget notes. So, so uh, yeah, with notes like these, I apologize in advance if my thoughts are a little disheveled. Um, I'll try my best, and with that said, I will go right into reviewing this episode, finally. So, I guess the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, the events at King's Landing. Uh, everything is pretty hectic after the murder of Joffrey. Um, naturally, everyone's blaming, especially Cersei, are blaming Tyrion Lannister for the murder. However, we immediately get faced with the fact that there are a lot of potential suspects out there. Um, I remember the first exchange between Elena and Marjorie was uh, one in which Olena overtly states that Joffrey's death isn't necessarily a bad thing for House Tyrell. Um, obviously, Marjorie is a bit upset by the event because, you know, she's she was starting to be able to somewhat control Joffrey. But even Olena overtly states that, you know, he wasn't the best match for you, not going to be a good king. So the fact that House Lannister still needs the Tyrells basically means that Marjorie is, at least from what I can gauge from, from what was stated, uh, that she can basically count on potentially becoming queen for a third time. Um, since, assumedly, according to Lena, the Lannisters really, really need the Tyrell's forces. Um, so yeah, so we're automatically faced with the idea that, okay, maybe she did it. The most interesting suspect, I think, that came out of this was Tywin Lannister. Now, one of the first things we see with him is the fact that during Joffrey's, I guess, funeral, or not his funeral, but his uh, his um, body being on display in the, in the Sept of Baelor, we have him talk to his other grandson, uh, Tommen Lannister, who is now the king. That was Joffrey's younger brother. And it's basically just showing Tywin talking to Tommen about how to properly lead. And he lays it right out there that Joffrey was not a good king and that Tommen has has uh, the makings to be a good king. And pretty much says, you know, he's not all that sorry about um, Joffrey's death. Now, this kind of gives the idea that maybe Tywin is responsible. At the same time, he did say in the last season to, uh, to Tyrion that he didn't kill him when he was born because he's a Lannister. So would Tywin kill a Lannister? For all intents and purposes, even though Joffrey was by name a member of House Baratheon, he was still very, very obviously a Lannister. And I don't think Tywin is oblivious to the fact that Joffrey is probably the love child of Cersei and Jaime. So, <clears throat> so yeah, Tywin's a suspect, but again, I'm not quite convinced that he's the one who done it because of what he said about saving um, Tyrion from being killed off when he was born. Um, the other possibility we have is, of course, the the Martells, Oberyn Martell, you know, who is in King's Landing because of his murdered sister from when the, when she was married to Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. Um, of course, Oberyn overtly states that he blames, or at least he thinks that Tywin Lannister is to blame. Uh, Tywin obviously denies that. And Oberyn had his poker face on. I gotta say, he didn't play it off like he was blaming Tywin at the end of that scene, but he certainly didn't seem totally convinced. That said, 
Tywin did offer him some pretty sweet deals. You know, he said he could be a member of the small council, um, and he could stand trial. He could be one of the judges for Tyrion's trial. And I found this kind of interesting because they have the actual lords stand on trial or stand as judges for Tyrion. There's no legitimate judges. It's actually just other landlords or noblemen who are the judges, which is quite quite intriguing. Hey folks, so uh, I apologize right away. I changed locations because I didn't want to, again, wake anyone up in the house. So I'm now in the garage. So keeping my train of thoughts moving, um, we're talking about, or at least I was talking about Oberyn Martell and his poker face and uh, the fact that he's a judge for uh, for Tyrion Lannister's trial. Um, another thought I had about Oberyn and I guess also uh, Ilaria Sand as Paramore is that they really, really seemed, I might get a bit of criticism for this, but they really seemed all, really oversexed in pretty much all their scenes. I mean, every time we see them, they're always doing something sexual, flirting with somebody in that process of making love, having sex, you know. No hatred to that. I mean, I don't have any personal problems with that. I just kind of wondered why it was so intently done or and so, or so um, emphasized. It's definitely an interesting choice. Um, irrespective of that, um, what else was there to say? Oh, yes. One very interesting thing that Oprin says to Tywin, um, I forget what the context, context was specifically, but Oberyn mentions that some believe that we, i.e. the people of Westeros, believe that they live in the, in the eye of a blue-eyed giant. And when I first heard that line, it kind of, it, it, it brought me back to something because I heard that line before in Game of Thrones. So I did a quick search and sure enough, it happened in the very same episode, episode three, but of season one, when Rob was talking to Bran and um, it was right after Bran had woken up from, you know, his fall. And Rob tells Bran that, oh, great old man. The, the, I think it was the oldest woman living in Winterfell and also the, I guess, Bran's caretaker, uh, told Rob when he was young that they live in the, in the eye of a blue-eyed giant. So I thought it was kind of funny that they brought that line up again. I don't know if there's anything significant to it. Hey, maybe they really do live in the eye of a blue-eyed giant. That would be pretty lols if you asked me if that were the case. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to bring that up again since it was, you know, raised again three, four seasons later in the exact same episode, i.e. episode three of that specific season. Um, moving it along. Okay, so here's another scene that happened at King's Landing. And this one was really controversial. I mean, there were hints that it was going to go down this way for a while, but I didn't actually think they would do this because... Well, I'm going to have to bring in the book here, but it does happen a little differently in the book. Okay, so I think most of you know I'm talking about the rape scene... Um, with Jamie and Cersei at the, I guess, right by their dead son's their dead son's body. Now, in the books, this scene does happen, but it happens in a very different way. It's a lot more, you know, consensual, for lack of better words. I know a lot of people are debating the scene, and there's a lot of craziness going on the internet already about, you know, whether this was or wasn't rape. I'm gonna be honest. If she said no. No is no. I mean, that's clearly rape. There's no excusing it. And it, I'm not going to lie, this scene did bother me for a number of reasons. Not just because it was rape, but mainly because it contradicts Jamie's character. Jamie in the last season, you know, he had this redemption. He had this moment where he had this realization that he is not just the Kingslayer. He is a Jamie. He's a person. And he wants to, you know, fight for the, for the right things in the world you know he wants to maintain his oath as a member of the as an as the commander of the king's guard and he's we get this impression that he's kind of forgo forgone his you know his wicked ways quote unquote so this scene really i don't know it seems to kind of throw all that throw all that out the window i mean why would jamie lannister rape his sister and of course cersei's no angel herself but wouldn't the idea or the fact that jamie rapes Cersei contradict everything he basically stands for <sighs> I don't know I have a I, don't know, I have a hard time really 
embracing that show change. And usually I don't really have any problems with the changes they make on the show, but this specific one did rub me the wrong way. And I really want to hear what you guys have to say about that because, yeah, I suspect there's going to be a lot of different opinions. Although, again, I really don't see how that seems anything else but rape. And there's been people on the internet saying, you know, it's not rape, it's not, it's consensual or, I don't know. I'll leave it at that. You guys share, share with me your opinion. I want to hear what you have to say about that specific thing. Good change, bad change. Do you agree with me? Kind of ruins Jamie's character progression. Yeah. Um, okay, so leave that big scene there. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, Sansa. Sansa's escape. So we find out that Littlefinger is the one who orchestrated Sansa's escape from King's Landing. Now, clearly this indicates that he has he must have had some kind of role to play in Joffrey's murder, or at least he must have been aware of it to some degree, because how would he have managed to get Ser Dantos to get Sansa aboard his ship without having some kind of, you know, chaotic diversion going on? Now, another thing I want to bring up is whether or not this quote-unquote rescue counts as a rescue, or is it him kidnapping Sansa? You know, I apologize if uh, if I miss something in this scene because my TV cut in and out a few times during this episode, which is really annoying, so I might have missed important details. Sorry, I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure my, nobody's woken up. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, if it was explained where, what he was going to do with her, but yeah. Kidnapping or rescue. Littlefinger has had so many contradictory objectives all throughout the series, so it's, it's hard to really gauge what his true intentions are. His intentions will be revealed, no doubt about it, and you know, I won't spoil what's going to happen to that, but it makes one question, you know, is he, have, does he have good intentions for Sansa? Are they bad intentions? What are his end goals? How, what does he gain by kidnapping Sansa? So stay tuned for that, folks. <laughs> uh, what else was there? What else? What else? What happened at King's Landing? Um, Tyrion. Tyrion's in prison, of course, and he gets visited by Pod. I thought this was, this was kind of a sweet scene. I don't really recall this scene happening in the books, per se. It might have. It's been a while since I read book three, but it definitely was a sweet scene. And, uh, you know, it goes to show that Pod is a good guy at the end of the day. We, st- we also find out that, as far as we're aware, Shay is still out of the city and she hasn't, you know, she escaped or she left successfully. So I hope that's the case. Again, it seems a little too good to be true, but, hey, we'll find out as the series goes on because, as we know, in Game of Thrones, no character just leaves and disappears unharmed or alive. You know, everybody goes out a good way or a bad way or at least lives to breathe another day so yeah i'm holding my breath for that uh, let's move on to the riverlands now so oh we have a few scenes here with ari and the hound and we get to you know gauge more of their of their personalities or interactions and uh sorry since it was a scene with aria and since my hair is a hot mess and uh i decided and i had my toque with me so i decided why not rep team stark so as you can see I'm wearing my nice toque or a beanie. I don't know what they call it elsewhere, but I call it a tuke. So, yeah. Go Team Stark. Or go. Go Arya. I'm repping you. Anyway, it was a bit of a sweet scene, but it was also bittersweet because, you know, we get the we get to gauge that it's going to be a cruel world out there and things are going to get rough, you know. Arya and the Hound, they play off as mother as father-daughter and get to be brought in by a religious peasant, I guess, and his daughter. And they're looked after for a night, but then they leave and they take his purse of money. Uh, Again, if something happened that I missed, it it cut out during this part, so I apologize. But from what I, from what I did see, um, yeah, it was just kind of a reaffirmation that things are going to get really rough in the Riverlands now with uh, the phrase in power, because we learned that now that the Tullys have been pretty much ousted, uh, that whole realm or that whole area is now in the hands of the phrase. And clearly the common folk do not like the phrase. And clearly they believe, at least this one peasant believes that, well, they're going to get their vengeance because they broke the sacred oath of guest right. You know, the phrase betrayed the Starks under the oath of protection. So bad times ahead for them. At least I hope. Hashtag Team Stark. (laughs) Okay, I didn't really have much to say about the Riverlands, but, um, you know, if there's anything, anybody has any thoughts on that, please let me know in the comments below. 
Uh, let's move on to Dragonstone. Okay, I like this scene in Dragonstone. It was very short again, but it was pretty sweet. Um, we, you know, Stannis gets another reaffirmation that Melisande's powers seem to be pretty real and pretty epic, considering her leeches, at least as far as we're led to believe, managed to kill Joffrey. And now, you know, this is more leverage for Stannis to get pissed off at his hand, his hand of the king, i.e. Um, Sir, oh my god, I'm having a blank, what's his name? The Onion Knight. Davos, there we go. That was bad, because he's one of my favorite characters. Anyway, it's more leverage against Sir Davos. So Davos, you know, it's frustrated, it's a frustrating situation. Davos is going to, he has to try to figure out how to raise men for Stannis, and he suggests that they hire mercenaries, the Gold Company, for example. Uh, Stannis seems a little miffed by that proposition, but uh, nevertheless, he ends his conversation with Davos on a slightly rough note. So, you know, Davos goes to Stannis's daughter, Shireen, for more reading lessons because he's learning how to read, of course. And I love this scene because in the previous episode, you know, they have we have Tywin and Olenna discussing the fact that the Bank of Bravos are expect well, they they loaned money to the, the Lannisters and to King's Landing, and they're expecting their money back. And uh, I gotta thank James Johnson for pointing this out in our spoiler review. And don't worry, I'm not gonna spoil anything. But he did mention this is that in that review that you know, if you don't pay a in this case in this case a bank back. And you're you have you know you rule a kingdom. They're gonna clearly go for somebody else to get this kingdom to pay them back. They're gonna get rid of whoever's not paying you back and or not paying them back and make sure that they get their dues. So when um, when Sir Davos is reading about the about the Bra- about Bravos, and I think he, that's when he when he uh, well light bulbs uh, click, and he realizes okay, um, it's not overly stated in the episode but we get the idea at least from that quick scene that you know i think davos is aware that the bravosi are expecting king's landing to pay them back at least for the costs that they owe them so from what i understood i think davos is at least had shireen write a letter to the bank of bravos that uh they at least i'm this is an assumption i'm making and i'm going to assume that they're writing to the bravosi tell them that they will pay back the what is due to them if they help Stannis reclaim the throne. At least this is my impression. Again, no spoilers. This is just my impression from what was said in that conversation or in that scene. So that's my hunch. I think that you know that Davos is going to mobilize the Bravosi to pressure King's Landing for the money. And if they don't give it back, well, we have another king to put on the throne to get our money back. So yeah, moving along. Uh, what do we have? We have the um, events at Castle Black. So there's some tension going on. I mean, we obviously get reaffirmed with the idea that there are very few men left at Castle Black after their failed expedition in the north. A lot of these men seem to have been rapists predominantly, which is troubling for, um, for Sam because he has Gilly there. And he's worried that Gilly is going to get into harm's way. Now, normally I'd be like, okay, I get where he's coming from. You don't, you can't really protect her in the face of all these rapists or ex-rapists at Castle Black. But why would you put her in, I think it's Gullstown? I forget the name of the town. Why on earth would you put her in a town which is clearly far from safe for her? I mean, he put her in a friggin' whorehouse from what it looked like as assistant to the innkeeper or uh, some kind of working girl there and not only that, not only that there are wildlings south of the wall ra- wandering around raping and pillaging do you really want to leave her outside of a castle in the middle of this town that could you know for all intents and purposes fall under plunder and i know that this isn't the immediate goal of the of the um of the wildlings because they're really just trying to rouse castle black to send out men to fight them and lower their numbers because, of course, the Wildlings think that the men at Castle Black have more men than they actually do. So <clears throat> I get that they might not attack this town, but still, still, Sam, there's dangers in the town and outside. Why would you do that? Anyway, moving it along, I guess I could talk about the Wildlings a little bit. Um, they, like I said, they're planning an attack. Uh, they're clearly trying to lure out Men of the Night's Watch, you know, by sacking little towns or, or farms 
And of course, we had that, that child that they sent back to tell them that they're going to, they're coming for them. John Snow, of course, is aware that this is a trap. They're trying to get lured out. So um, John is also concerned that those men of the Night's Watch that are still free in the northern, or that are free north of the wall, and who are still at Craster's Keep, um, might reveal information if they get captured by any of the wildlings. Which, of course, is bad because these people who are Craster's Keep pretty much killed their Lord Commander. So... What's to say that they won't easily, at the drop of a dime, betray Castle Black and the, the Men of the Night's Watch and tell, that these, and tell these wildlings, oh, we only have 100 men left at the castle, considering how little loyalty they actually do have, obviously, especially Rast the Rapist. I forget if, it, if they said that the that Craster's Keep came under the control of Rast or if it was under that um, another character who was played by, I forget his name, Gordon Byrne? Burns? I'm sorry. Anyway, bottom line... Jon Snow resolves to suggest that they go back to Craster Keep and take care of business there, so I'm looking forward to see what happens there. It's not something we really see in the book, or at least this, is, this scene does not happen in the books at all, if I recall, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, what else can I talk about? What else happened this episode? <laughs> um... Okay, I guess I could discuss the events at long last across the Narrow Sea with Daenerys. I love all of Daenerys' scene, and as you all know, and even though I'm wearing a Stark beanie right now or a toque, I am Team Danny to the end. So it was a short scene. It was a sweet scene. I really wish they continued it. I really wish they showed us what happened in the end. But sadly, we don't get to see that. Um, what we do see, however, is um, after she, you know, arrives at Marine, has um, Dario Naharis kill the champion of the Miranese people, um, and then basically insults them, and then catapults the chains of slaves back at the Miranese people. Um, I think the cliffhanger note we are left on is a sort of... Um, of, uh, of notion that she might not attack. <clears throat> she only, you know, of course, she didn't actually, like, start marching her soldiers towards the city. She just had them catapult <clears throat> these chains. So I think it's more or less giving the Marinese an ultimatum. Of course, we see one of the Marinese people um, who looks on at their army and seems... I don't know if you, I should say he's impressed by her, but he has he's a bit amazed by what's going on. And I don't know if that character is going to become significant. I don't know if any of you noticed him during the scene but um definitely watch out next episode i hope we get to see more of daenerys and uh the things that take place there because i think what goes down in that whole region might surprise some of you i'm gonna leave it at that but uh it was definitely a good scene it was definitely you know satisfying when she gave her great speech and just told them and just addressed the slaves of the city rather than the nobles <sighs> really rouses some joy in you in me anyway. <laughs> so I think that's about it. Again, I apologize for the slightly budget nature of this uh, review. I didn't have any of my uh, proper, well, I have my iPhone, I guess, with me, but I, you know, I wasn't really prepared to to fully write out my, my thoughts properly and give it some time, give it some thought. Again, this episode was, this episode was just great, so I just felt the need to do it right away. So, um, yeah, next week will be more professional, I promise. But uh, here you have my raw emotional reaction to the episode as a whole. Definitely a really good episode. Not quite as epic as the last one, but still, you know, really sweet ending. Really left us on a nice cliffhanger as to what's going to happen next in Marine with Daenerys. And first of all, okay, I have one comment to make about that scene. If I was Daenerys, instead of sending out Dario Naharis to kill the friggin'... Um, knight or whoever that guy was the, the champion of marine i would have sent out a freaking dragon i mean what better message to send than having a dragon just swoop down and pick up that guy and gorge him to pieces you know what i'm saying anyway it's all my thought or at least burn him or something i don't know anyway as a whole i give this episode maybe like a nine out of ten definitely awesome definitely awesome especially the ending lots of satisfying new information revealed some mild changes I didn't really enjoy, but nature of the beast, right? 
Um, so yeah, that's all for this time. If you want to check out my rev- my group review that I'll be doing with a few other people um, in a couple of weeks, which does contain spoilers, really intensive spoilers, and it's going to be a really, really great review, I can tell you right now. So I will post a link to that video in my info box below. And um, yeah, it's going to be on James Johnson's channel. So be sure to check it out. We'll probably do the video review either Tuesday or Wednesday and uh, possibly even live. So keep your eyes peeled. I will, I will deliver the information as I find it out. So yeah, that's all for now, folks. I hope you enjoyed this review as much as you could given the circumstances. And uh, again, if you liked it, don't hesitate to subscribe or like this video or, you know, especially comment. I love to hear feedback. I love to hear what you guys thought of this episode because watching Game of Thrones is a group effort or I should say group enjoyment. So yeah, that is all. Oh, and uh, before I forget, if you were hearing some weird snoring noises in the background, that was my dire wolf, or should I say dire dog? Well, just a dog, a really old chocolate Labrador, my baby, Charlie right over here. Where is she? There she is. She's fast asleep. So I apologize to her for keeping her up. Um, I got my nice Game of Thrones notebook here. Forgot from HMV. Anyway, that is all for now. I'll let it. I'll end it at that. And I hope to hear from you all soon. Peace out.